Chapter 5 Taming the Bear The Entente Cordiale unquestionably signaled a dramatic shift in British foreign policy, but it was neither a formal alliance nor the first move to end Britain's splendid isolation. It was a convenient act of friendship that drew both nations closer at a point where their other commitments might have been driven might have driven them forcibly apart. France was allied to Russia and Britain to Japan, and a war between Russia and Japan would have proved a serious blow for the secret elite had the Entente not been in place. While in the long term, Russia played a vital role in the web of European alliances. There remained in 1904 unfinished business in the Far East that had come to be concluded before the secret elite could mount its relationship with Russia to its own advantage. Britain and Russia had been a loggerhead for 20 years over claims and counterclaims on Persia, Afghanistan, and China. The British feared that Russia ultimately intended to add India to her overstretched empire. Politicians talked repeatedly of the Russia menace to India. India was sacrosanct. Time and again, the logistics and cost of defending what Disraeli had described as the brightest jewel in the crown were raised in Parliament. Grave concerns were expressed about the numbers of troops needed to defend the borders of India. In 1902, it was estimated that 140,000 soldiers would be needed for that purpose. The question asked in Parliament was, where are we going to get the other 70,000 British troops to add to the 70,000 already there. Without denuding the United Kingdoms of the forces necessary to uphold our interests in other parts of the British Empire. Astonishingly, astonishingly the, the secret elite solution lay in Japan, informed through their diplomatic, industrial, commercial, and banking ties they knew that Japan was equally alarmed by Russia's intrusion into the Far East. Japan had proved herself a major player in Far Eastern affairs by invading China in a Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, and to the astonishment of all, utterly defeated her gigantic neighbor. Japan promptly annexed Korea, Formosa, and the Leotung Peninsula of Manchuria, with its strategic port of Port Arthur. Such impertinence from a lesser nation offended Russia, France, and Germany, who sent a joint ultimatum demanding the immediate withdrawal of, Chinese, of Japanese troops from the peninsula and her warships from Port Arthur. The German demanded... The German demand was particularly rude and diplomatically inept. By expressing her intention, her intention to remove all menaces to peace in the Far East, Germany made an unnecessary enemy of a nation that valued courtesy and despised the loss of face. Japan reluctantly complied, but insult was added to injury when Russia troops into the Russia troops into the peninsula and berthed her warships in Port Arthur. At last, she had access to a port that would not be icebound throughout the long Russian winters. For the better part of a hundred years, the Tsar's empire had been groping southwards for a warmer, for a warm water port. The British opposition had been absolute to any advance towards the Black Sea Straits or the Persian Gulf. That resolve that resolved remained intact, but it was transparently obvious that Russia intended to enlarge her empire in the Far East and Port Arthur provided the perfect harbor. This the secret elite could not allow. Russia was in a position to threaten Britain's Far East trade and was one step closer to India. The Russian Empire held no secrets from the international financiers, from whom they had to repeatedly borrow vast amounts of money. For the investors who developed the oil fields around Baku, 
Russian commercial and financial practices fitted poorly with the ambitious foreign policy, and the Tsar's treasury was drained of any reserves. The Paris Rothschilds, in particular, raised huge sums of bonds to develop Russia's railways and small but growing industries. In 1894, a Rothschild-led syndicate raised a 400 million franc loan for which Alfonso de Rothschild was decorated with the Grand Cross by the Tsar. The secret elite knew that the Trans-Siberian Railway would enable Russia to transport its armies by rail from one side of the country to the other. The 6,365 mile of single track also provided great, opportunity, great opportunities for the expansion of trade between Moscow and the Far East, in direct competition with British and Japanese interest. Fully aware that the line was to be completed by 1905, the secret elite appreciated that there was a strict time frame within which action would have to be taken before the might of the Tsar's armed forces marched into new conquest in, J in China, Korea, and Manchuria. There were, however, no means by which the British Army and Royal Navy could effectively intervene. It was a conundrum solved by a stroke of pure genius. Impressed by the Japanese success against China and confident of their antith antipathy towards Russia, the secret elite promoted Japan as the England of the Far East. The Japanese spent almost their last yen in the creation of a large army and a strong fleet, much of it underwritten by international bankers in London. From the mid-1890s, British shipyards built warships for the Imperial Japanese Navy. The first pre-dreadnought battleship, the Fuji, was launched in 1897 from the Thames Ironworks in Blackwall, London while her sister ship, the Yashima, was built by Armstrong Whitworth in Newcastle. When the Asahi was launched at John Brown's in Clyde Bank in 1899, she was the heaviest ever Clyde built warship to that date. A 10-year Japanese naval program with the construction of six battleships and six armored cruisers at its core meant that in Britain the armaments industry thrived and the work was most welcome on the Clyde, the Thine, and the Thames. The last of these battleships, the Mikasa, was ordered from Vickers Shipyard in Barrow and Furness at the end of 1898 for delivery to Japan in 1902. She took three years to complete at the enormous cost of 880,000 pounds, an equivalent to 74.5 million in current value. As a rule, the Japanese ships were slightly smaller than their British counterparts, but were consequently faster. Quietly and unobtrusively, Britain built the most modern battle fleet possible for the Imperial Japanese Navy, created jobs for its own shipyard workers, made substantial profits for the owners and shareholders, and effectively provided Japan with the means of with the means to police the seas in the Far East. Events in China and Manchuria in nineteen hundred and nineteen oh one further alarmed both countries. The Boxer Rebellion against the hated foreigners who had more or less stripped China of her natural resources was put down savagely by an international alliance. German, Russian, French, British, American, Japanese, Austro-Hungarian, and Italian troops were sent to lift the siege of their, legis of their legations in Peking. Russia, however, used the rebellion as a pretext to invade Manchuria and signals her intention to stay. She was determined to partition China 
and end the open-door commercial policy that brought rich pickings to international traders. Japan brooded over the Tsar's intention and appeared to waver making making an alliance with Russia and accepting their domination of China or allying, allying with Britain and squaring up to them. Balfour's government in London had decided to break 500 years of insular tradition by wooing Japan. The advantages of splendid isolation paled into insignificance in those Boer War years with the looming threat of Russian expansion and the international scorn in foreign newspapers that had followed British military failures against the Boer farmers. The secret elite could never dominate the world by sticking to high and bound tradition. Negotiations were conducted in secret between Lord Lansdowne and the Japanese ambas ambassador in London. An Anglo-Japanese treaty was signed on the 30th of January, 1902. Some historians portrayed the treaty as a victory for Japan, claiming it had terrified the British government into a rushed agreement. Terrified. Not in the knowledge that their common bond was a determination to stop Russian expansion in China and Manchuria. Rushed. It had been at least eight long years in the planning. Britain's clear intention was to contain Russian expansion in the Far East and protect the British Empire, especially India, from a known predator. The official reason, as stated in Parliament, was that government's anxiety to maintain the status quo in China and recognize Japan's rights in Korea. The treaty stated that if either Britain or Japan came involved, became involved in war over China or Korea against a single enemy, the other would remain neutral. If, however, either became involved in the war with more than one power, if, say, France joined Russia in a war against Japan, Britain would be bound to intervene on behalf of Japan. Undoubtedly, it was the subtext that angered Russia, and it might have caused the French considerable consternation had they not been more interested in King Edward's overtures for the Anglo-French Entente. Essentially, Britain was given Japan permission to go to war against Russia with the promise to cover its back if any other powers intervened. The implications for both France and Germany were clear. They should stay out of this. There were also a number of secret clauses wherein the British and Japanese governments agreed to permit each other naïves agreed to permit each other navies to use coaling coaling stations and docking facilities and maintain in the extreme east a naval force greater than any third power. What particularly appealed to the secret elite was the additional bonus it brought. With the war in South Africa bleeding resources, the treaty with Japan offered a cost-effective way to protect British interests in the Far East. Naval powers, British naval power could be concentrated in the in and around the Atlantic and North Sea waters, the Imperial Japanese Navy would operate on Britain's behalf by proxy. Parliamentarians, parliamentarians were less than happy about the bombshell announcement on the 12th of February, 1902. The treaty was a complete surprise, a bolt from the blue, a momentous departure from the time-honored policy of this country. It was the first time Britain had concluded an offensive and defensive alliance with the foreign power, and the first that any European power had concluded with an Oriental race. Complaints were lodged about its secrecy, its sudden announcement as a fait accompli, the dangerous nature of an alliance that tied Britain hard and fast to the wheels of Japanese policy and the fact that no one seemed to have previously thought it necessary. To the taunt that Britain had sought the treaty, to the taunt that Britain had sought the treaty, the Under Secretary of State at the Foreign Office, Viscount Cranbourne, elder son and heir of Lord Salisbury and cousin to the Prime Minister, retorted with the arrogance of a true aristocrat. It is not for us to seek treaties, we grant them. 
arrogant duplicity was at the core of the secret elite. Behind the illusion of munificent generosity, they sharpened their focus on every element that would serve their cause. The secret elite did not operate with transparency, nor seek the consent of parliament. They took action as when required to promote their agenda. Incidental matters drawn to the attention of parliament, such as the practice of a British colony, namely Australia, of preventing the immigration of Japanese citizens was not their concern. As ever, their approach was to disregard the screamers. Two years later, on the 8th of February, 1904, Japan put the treaty to the test with a preemptive torpedo boat attack on Russian warships in Port Arthur. There was no declaration of war. It was reminiscent of the crippling strike by the British Navy on the, on the Danish fleet berthed at Copenhagen in 1807. A series of indecisive naval engagements followed that provided cover for a Japanese landing in Korea. From, Inca, from Incheon, the Japanese occupied Seoul and the rest of Korea, and then the rest of Korea. The Tsar was ill-advised to order the Russian Baltic fleet halfway and more around the world to liberate Port Arthur and settle the devious Japanese. It was a mission that began inauspiciously and ended disastrously. On the night of the 21st, October of 1904, the Gamecock Fish and Fleet sailed out the hull to, tall, to troll their North Sea beat at the Dogger Bank, only to find ships of the Tsar's Baltic Fleet passing before them through the clearing fog. Waving and cheering, they gathered to watch what they thought were British naval maneuvers. When the warships turned their sea search, when the warships turned their searchlights towards them, the fishermen ceased their work and laughed and reveled in their glare. Seconds later, the Russians opened fire. The trawler crane was sunk, its captain and first mate killed, and six other fishermen wounded one of whom died a few months later. In the general chaos, Russian ships shot at each other. Fear and false information combined to make fools of the Russian Navy. The outrage inflamed the British public. The Russians claimed that they had mistaken the fishing vessels for Japanese torpedo boats, which might sound ridiculous. But the general nervousness of the Russian sailors and false reports about the presence of Japanese torpedo boats, submarines, and minefields in the North Sea lent credence to their fears. The Dogger Bank incident assumed international status with newspaper reports of headless fishermen, mutated corpse, and innocent victims. Reparations were demanded. The Foreign Office sent an immediate note to protest, of protest to St. Petersburg and the mayor of Hull wrote to the Prime Minister demanding the speediest and strongest measures to ensure full redress. Matters were in danger of spiraling out of hand. Count Beckendorf, the Russian ambassador, was attacked as he got into his cab at Victoria Station and had to be rescued by police. Foreign Secretary Lansdowne met urgently with Prime Minister Balfour and the King. The government had to exercise concerted damage limitation to dampen down the violent anti-Russian outburst. National newspapers regretted, regretted the targeting of Bank and Altdorf, and the Standard rebuked the mob for such a foolish demonstration. On the 24th of October, the Daily News carried an exclusive apology for the Russian ambassador. From the Russian ambassador, I authorize you to say to me, I authorize you to say from me to the people of England that I am absolutely certain that what occurred was a deplorable incident. While acknowledging that the outrage was probably due to wicked negligence, the colonial secretary, Alfred Littleton, urged everyone to hold themselves entirely courteous to Russia giving her every credit for her ready disavowal 
and disassociating the many good people in Russia from any sympathy with such an outrage. The Times joined and the, the Times joined in with an editorial stressing that there is no wish to humiliate Russia or hurt her legitimate sus susceptibilities more than is absolutely demanded in the interest of justice. What was going on? Russia was at war with Britain's one and only ally, Japan. The attack on the fishing fleet could have been construed for a reason as a reason for British intervention in the Russo Japanese Russo Japanese War. Yet the secret elite moved instantly to maintain good relations with Russia. Why? Despite their fears over the security of India and distrust of Russians' intentions in China, they focus on their own long term agenda. Never for one instant did they take their eyes off Germany. Paradoxically, while they intended Russia to fail in the Far East, there was no merit in further estranging her, further estranging her in Europe. Russia was earmarked for future use against Germany. In the French Foreign Office at the Quai d'Orsay, diplomats feared that the recently signed Entente might be jeopardized just at the moment when Britain and France were colluding over Morocco and positioning themselves against the Kaiser, this diplomatic crisis threatened the new spirit of harmony between London and Paris. Given that the French were formally allied to the Russians, the possibility of France being drawn into the Russo-Japanese war provoked real heart search. No one could possibly have anticipated the dogger camp complication and the diplomatic impasse that ensued, but the secret elite had to find a solution. Del Casse, always King Edward's favorite Frenchman, managed to get both Russia and Britain to agree to take the dispute to the Hague for an international arbitration. Russian ministers had no motion of how deeply the cost was personally associated with the secret elite. He had a vested interest in France remaining on good terms with both Britain and Russia and knew that delay would only allow the dispute to fester. As Russia's Baltic fleet sailed ponderously in a seven-month sojourn from its northern habitat to its closely monitored it was closely monitored by the Royal Navy. Each coiling station noted, each vessel counted and watched. In the preceding years, the secret elite had given the Japanese Navy access to large quantities of the best quality, practically smokeless Welsh coal, while refusing to sell Russia even a pound of it. Much to the annoyance of the Tsars, others were more helpful to the Russian fleet. Germany provided 60 coiling barges, and France allowed them to use Cam Ranch Bay in French Indo Indochina as a naval base. For the Russians to be given this vital assistance, virtually on Japan's doorstep, was viewed as an affront, and the Japanese press demanded that Britain join in the war. The Times called on the class to deal with the breaches of neutrality with promptitude and firmness. In a stern warning, the French were reminded that any action England may take is inspired by the strongest wish to avert the possibility of an incident that might dissolve the Entente and compel them to take opposite sides in the great international controversy. This was a breathtaking example of double, double standards as Britain had been supplying Japan with warships and coal for a decade in preparation for this moment. Just days before the two warring fleets faced up to each other, a decision was taken in London to renew the terms of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty. The secret elite moved yet another piece on the chessboard of diplomatic intrigue. Lansdowne proposed a stronger alliance, in which both Japan and Britain would go to war in support of each other if any country attacked either of them. 
This was a significant change. So too was the acknowledgement by the Japanese that Britain had the right to safeguard her possessions in India. Problems associated with the defense and security of India had greatly concerned the British Parliament for many years. The complexities of raising and transporting any army, an army to protect her borders had been discussed in detail. This was solved by the terms of the new treaty. Japan would act as guarantor of the British Raj. On the 26th of May, with the two opposing navies stream, steaming towards their apocalyptic destiny, the Japanese ambassador presented a draft treaty to Lord Lansdowne that specifically included Britain's rights in India. The crown jewel had another guardian, a trusted ally who had the ability to react quickly to any threat from, Russian, from Russia or Germany in the future. Bad though Dogger Bank had been, bad though as bad as Dogger Bank had been, nothing prepared the Tsar for the disaster that awaited their Baltic fleet in the Tsushima Strait between Korea and southern Japan. On the twenty sixth on the twenty seventh and the twenty eighth of May nineteen oh five, the Japanese Navy destroyed two thirds of the Russian fleet. It had endured a voyage. It had endured a voyage of over eighteen thousand nautical miles to perish in the far east. The outcome was so significant that the Battle of Tsushima, Tsushima, had was hailed even in England as by far the greatest and most important naval event since Trafalgar. Two days of relentless fighting saw the British built Imperial Japanese fleet destroy all eight Russian battleships and all three of their smaller coastal battleships. Only one cruiser and two destroyers lent into Vladivostok. Vladivostok. Triumphant, triumphant in the Far East. The Japanese were rewarded with enhanced international status and a peace settlement brokered by President Roosevelt in September of 1905. They gained exclusive rights in Korea and controlled and control of the Leotong Peninsula, including, including Port Arthur. Russia was forced to pay a huge war indemnity and grant Japan additional fishing rights in their territorial waters. This was a momentous victory for Japan. It held even greater significance for the secret elite. The real victors were in London. At a stroke, the problem of defending India had been transformed at little cost to the British Exchequer. Ex Indeed, the British built battleships and cruisers had generated immense profit for the city. During the war, an international consortium, including British-owned banking houses like Barings, Samuels, and the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, raised over five billion pounds at today's value to assist Japan. Almost half of Japan's war debts was financed through bonds sold mostly in London and Europe, London and New York. Money was not the problem. Manipulators at the heart of the secret elite, like Escher, facilitated meetings held on Rothschild's premises, on Rothschild's premises, to help the Japanese financial envoy Takashaki Korekio raise their war chest, while banks with strong links to the Rothschilds were prepared to raise funds for Japan quite openly. The Rothschilds had to tread carefully because of their immense Russian investments, not least in the Baku oil fields. They were also aware of the political repercussions that might ensure that might ensue for Russian Jews who bore the harsh brunt of Tsarist anti-Semitism. The change once the war was over, that changed once the war was over. The London and Paris Rothschilds negotiated a for a further forty eight million pound issue to help Japanese economic recovery. 
at a return, the war profits flowed back to the secret elite. Russia's far eastern designs lay in tatters. She, she had been trounced by land and sea and was damaged and vulnerable. The warm water port was gone. Civil unrest and widespread and revolution hung in the air. The bloody Sunday massacre of more than 500 protesters outside of the Winter Palace in January of 1905 was followed in February by an assassination of the Tsar's uncle. By March, the Russian army had suffered an unprecedented defeat in Manchuria. In April, ethnic grievances manifested themselves, and in May, the unions were demanding universal suffrage and parliamentary government. By June of 1905, much of the navy had been destroyed and mutiny broke out in the Potemkin, Potemkin Russia's, on the Potemkin, Russia's most powerful battleship in the Black Sea. July riots in Odessa saw over 60,000, saw over 6,000 civilians killed before a half-hearted step towards constitutional market monarchy was proposed in August. In September, famine threatened and in October, open revolt shut down factories, transport, and manufacturing, with 1,500,000 men on strike. November mutinies in Konstrad were followed in December by a horrific pogrom of Jewish villagers in Odessa. Maltreatment of Jewish communities disgusted fair-minded people in Britain. And Russian influence stood at an all-time low. Time and circumstance favored a radical move by the secret elite. Broken and almost friendless, the Tsar was ready to grasp the proffered, the proffered hand from the very people who had reduced his empire to its withered state. Then, unexpectedly, the Kaiser almost stole the prize. Kaiser Wilhelm had, since June 1904, been courting his cousin the Tsar to create an alliance between Russia and Germany that would change the face of the European alliances. Emboldened by Dick Classe's political demise, but still concerned by his claims that the British were ready to go to war, the Kaiser made a bold move in July of 1905. Germany had been very supportive of Russia during the war with Japan by providing the coal for the Baltic fleet as it headed towards the Far East. In a series of telegrams and letters released by the Bolsheviks in 1917, Wilhelm sought a new relationship with Russia. He suggested an alliance. Not only would it have undermined the Entente, but Germany's historic enemy, France, would have been left to choose either to throw her lot in with Russia, her ally, or abandon Russia and confirm an alliance with Britain. Wilhelm promised Nicholas that once the French realized that the British fleet could not save Paris, they would accept reality and fall in line behind them. In this way, a combination of three of the strongest continental powers would be formed to attack whom the Anglo-Japanese group would think twice before acting. He reasoned that it would guarantee peace in Europe by safeguarding both Russia and Germany. Reeling from the defeat by Japan, Tsar Nicholas secretly signed an alliance on the 24th of July of 1905 on board his yacht moored off to Bajorko Sound. No officials from the Russian court were present. No ministers knew what had been proposed and agreed. It was to their treaty. It was to be their treaty. Nicholas was willing to grasp the hand of friendship from his cousin, who argued passionately that Russia had been badly let down by France. The Kaiser understood exactly what Edward VII intended, and to reassure the Tsar, he wrote again to him on the 22nd of August, 1905, that Britain only wanted to make France her cat's paw. 
tool against us as she used Japan against you. It was an impressive assessment. He advised Nicholas that Edward, the arch intriguer and mischief maker in Europe, as the Tsar himself had called him, had been work had been hard at work trying to discover precisely what had transpired in Bajorko. Indeed, he had. Rumors suggested that some private deal had been struck between the two royal cousins, but no one appeared to know precisely what it amounted to. King Arthur, King Edward, asked Bankendorf, asked Bankendorf, Bankendorf, the Russian ambassador at London, to go to Denmark to find out what had been agreed. He met there with the dog wagger with the dog wagger empress of Russia and one of the key figures in the secret elites network the russian ambassador to copenhagen alexander isvolsky all were staunch anglophiles when kaiser wilhelm heard of this he sent an angry telegram to the tsar complaining that edward had the audacity to use the russian diplomatic service to his own ends no one knew what had been agreed until the Tsar confided to his foreign minister, Count Lambsdorff, that he had signed a secret treaty with Germany on board his private yacht. As King Edward had said to him, Landorf is such a nice man and let me know all I want to hear. Let's me know all I want to hear. The cat was out of the bag. Suddenly the secret elite were confronted by a potential alliance that threatened to blow their grand plan apart. How they managed to kill the Bajorko Treaty is further testament of the power of the secret elite extended across Europe. It had been formally ratified. Bajorko would have signaled a realignment that transformed the balance of international alliances. This dangerous treaty had to be squashed. Russian newspaper began immediately to attack the Kaiser, who complained. The whole of your influential press, Novosti, Noe, Wema, Ruski, etc., have since a fortnight become violently anti-German and pro-British. Partly they were, partly they are bought by heavy sums of British money, no doubt. His suspicions were not without foundation. Russia was already in desperate financial straits after Tushishima and in need of fresh loans. The Paris Bourse had deeper, more reliable pockets than the Berlin banks, and had traditionally been the main source of financial backing for, for Russia. The secret elite threatened to pull the financial plug unless the Tsar came to his senses. Much to the disappointment of Kaiser Wilhelm, the opportunity to realign Europe towards a greater peace fell before it reached the first horde fell before it reached the first hurdle. Tsar Nicholas backtracked and the treaty never was. Though, as Wilhelm bitterly reminded him, we joined hands and signed before God, who heard our vows. His desperate appeal fell on deaf ears. The Kaiser was absolutely correct. The secret elite was prepared to use any nation as a cat's paw, and Russia became the victim of British trickery manipulated into a different treaty that was designed to protect her or the peace of Europe but to enable the secret elite to destroy Germany. In their eyes, a vulnerable Tsar had almost grasped the wrong hand of friendship and the near disaster at Bajorico focused minds. Despite the alarming evidence of riots in the streets of St. Petersburg and the slaughter of protesters at the Winter Palace on Bloody Sunday, King Edward began to court Tsar Nicholas with the ultimate aim of a three-way alliance between Britain, Russia, and France against Germany. Britain, France, and Russia against Germany. The Russian Navy was invited to visit Portsmouth, Portsmouth at the King's request and Russian officers and crew were brought to London and treated lavishly with banquets banquets and nights out at the theater. Much was made in the pliant press of the public warmth of the London crowds who cheered the Russians. 
The Times talked of a rapprochement with Russia as a natural and inevitable follow-on to the Entente with France. While the British public was softened up by the anticipation of an alliance with Russia, the bear was being enticed into a honey trap. Secret elite knew, the secret elite drew Russia in with a com- The secret elite drew Russia in with the commitment that they never intended to deliver. Russia was secretly promised control of Constantinople and the Black Sea Straits, following a successful war against Germany. This was Russia's holy grail, her historic mission. She had long coveted free passages for her warships through the Straits, to the exclusion of all others. From the reign of Catherine the Great, Russian leaders had entertained an ambition to control Constantinople in order to have a warm water port and an unrestricted naval outlet to the Mediterranean. It promised access to trade, wealth, and conquest. For the obvious reasons, not least the deafening public outcry that would have followed, the Anglo-Russian Convention, signed on the 31st of August, 1907, made no mention of Constantinople or the Straits, but was crafted with reference only to Persia, Afghanistan, and Tibet, just as the French ravages had been offered the carrot of regaining Elise and Lorraine. Alsace and Lorraine, so the secret promise dangled in front of Russia was post-war control of the Black Sea Straits. It was yet another secret deal hidden from Parliament and the people, yet another spurious promise that Britain never intended to keep. Basking in the success of his sterling work with King Edward in preparing the grounds for an alliance, the Russian diplomat Alexander Izvolsky was promoted in 1906 from the relatively unimportant post at Copenhagen to Minister of Foreign Affairs in St. Petersburg. This was a spectacular promotion and one that could not have taken place without support and influence. He was clearly a man who had proved his worth to the secret elite in the days and months after Bajorko and their financial rewards guaranteed his compliance. He was a bought man Prior to this point, he had been bankrupt and had no personal wealth with which to promote his own career. Once linked directly by the king to Sir Arthur Nicholas, who had been moved from Spain, from Spain to be the British ambassador to St. Petersburg, Izvolsky enjoyed a patronage whose source he would never fully comprehend. He was af- thereafter a man of means with access to secret elite funds that promoted their ambitions as well as his own. In addition to the benefits of old-fashioned bribery, the new alliance gelled naturally because Ivolsky's aims harmonized with the London policy of encircling Germany. As this history unfolds, others will emerge whose service were brought and loyalty secured, whose services were bought and loyalty secured. As was often the case in foreign affairs, the signaling of the Anglo-Russian Convention was kept secret until Parliament had risen for the summer break. So denying the screamers an opportunity to express their objections, the official terms of the Convention were not made known until the the 25th of September, leaving sufficient time for those journalists in the know to determine that such a diplomatic agreement with Russia was clearly to benefit the British Empire, and it was. The central feature was a partition of Persia by which Britain gained a clear sphere of interest around around Basra and the Gulf. These desert lands were to prove far from barren when the oil-rich fields were opened some six years later. British interests in the Gulf were deeply enmeshed with commerce oil and the Suez Canal the route to India, and the exclusion of Russia from a warm water port. Foreign office negotiators gained every advantage possible and in exchange, and, and in exchange gave promises they would never, that would never be kept. No mention was made of the closing of the net on Germany. 
she had not been ruined by war with Japan. No mention was made of closing the net on Germany had she not been ruined by war with Japan in desperate need of inward investment and incapable of pursuing the dream of a warm water port by any other means. Russia might have walked away from the convention. Had she not been ruined by war in Japan in desperate need of inward investment and incapable of pursuing the dream of a warm watered port by any other means, Russia might have well walked away from the convention. But she was exactly in the position that the secret elite had intended, on her knees. They raised her to her feet in the guise of a good Samaritan. An alliance with Russia, no matter how vague, was deeply unpopular with many sections of society. But Lord Corzon, from the inner circle of the elite, defended the liberal government in the House of Lords and boldly announced that, in his view, it was very natural. It was all very natural. His claims were ridiculous and self-serving. I think there is no agreement that would generally be more acceptable to this house or to the country than one with the Russia with Russia. Only a member of the aristocracy or the secret elite could have made such an outrageously untruthful statement. The Tsar and his brutal regime were totally anathema to the fair minded people everywhere. Summary Chapter 5, Taming the Bear The major powers were astonished in 1902 when Britain formed an alliance with Japan. Britain supported her new ally by building a modern fleet for the Imperial Japanese Navy and providing huge loans for Japan's industrial development. In order to protect both Britain and Japanese interests in the Far East, the secret elite encouraged Japan to attack Russia. In a brutal war from 1904 to 1905, Japan decimated Russian forces in the east. An unfortunate incident with the British fishing fleet at the Dogger Bank caused such a public out outrage against Russia that the secret elite had to calm the press. Although the British wanted Russia out of the far east and away from India, their long-term aim was to draw her into an alliance against Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm virtually preempted this in July of 1905 by signing a secret agreement with the Tsar at Pachorko that would have blown apart the secret elite's grand plan. The secret elite, in turn, used all of their diplomatic, economic, and political clout to negate the proposed Russo-German alliance before it could be made public and ratified. A second Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1905 offered direct Japanese protection of India. As Kaiser Wilhelm cor correctly stated, Britain had used Japan to remove the Russian threat in the East and her intention was to similarly use France against Germany in Europe. The secret elite understood Russia's historic mission to gain an ice-free port and dangled the carrot of Constantinople in the Straits to entice her. The Anglo-Russian convention was allegedly about Persia, but in reality it paved the way towards an Anglo-French-Russian alliance against Germany. Having assisted King Edward and the secret elite to destroy the Kaiser's Bajorko Agreement, Alexander Izvolsky was subsequently promoted to Minister of Foreign Affairs at St. Petersburg. Previously bankrupt, Izvolsi was bankrolled by the secret elite through the British diplomatic service. 